Hi, my name is Elisa Trotz. I am a Guyanese. I live in Canada where I teach at the University of Toronto. And I am the editor of the anthology by um, the Guyanese feminist, radical, social, intellectual, and political thinker and activist, Andaye. Um, it's called The Point is to Change the World, selected texts by Andaye. It was published in 2020, one year after she died, in, uh, on the 31st of May 2019, by Pluto Press out of um, London. It has recently been translated into Portuguese by Editora Funilaria, and um, Editora, Editora Funilaria, in, um, in partnership with the Laura Campos and Marielle Franco Foundation, has made it available for a Brazilian audience, which is just wonderful. This book is not as yet, sadly, widely available in the Caribbean. And to know that the first translation is in the country just next door to, to Guyana is so important and so significant to us all. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, this book and about Andai. As I said, she was a radical, social, political, intellectual activist and thinker. She was born in 1942 and died in 2019. In fact, one month after we had finished selecting all of the pieces for this book. And I was a member of a political movement that was involved in the anti-dictatorial struggle in Guyana during the 1970s and 1980s. It was called the Working People's Alliance. It um, was a socialist movement and became a political party. She served as its international secretary. In the 1980s, she would go on to become a member and executive um, member of the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action. And she also would end up leaving the party, the Working People's Alliance, to found a grassroots multiracial women's organization called Red Thread in 1986. And internationally, she would go on to join the Global Women's Strike and Women of Color in the Global Strike organizations that came out of the International Wages for Housework campaign that was founded by the Marxist feminist Selma James. So this book, The Point is to Change the World, represents selections of writings by Andai over 50 years, part of an archive that would have not been available to a wider audience had we not decided to bring this together. She's very clear that it's not a usual book. These are not chapters. This is not a university book. It is not an academic book. These are a variety of um, forms of writing, speeches, letters to the newspaper, newspaper columns, pieces she wrote with others, talks she gave, some talks that we transcribed in order to make them available in the book, which represent her interests over a wide range of topics that relate to Guyana as well as to the Caribbean. In 1989, Andai was diagnosed with cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and underwent a brutal series of um, treatments that included chemotherapy, where she says the chemotherapy um, helped to send her cancer into remission, but damaged her health fundamentally. It left her with lung and heart disease, which means that when the can meant that when the cancer came back as breast cancer in 2012, she ended up opting for a radical mastectomy under local anesthetic because um, her health had been so compromised that she would not have survived uh, an operation under general anesthetic. At that point, we decided that it was really important to begin to collect her work and to make her writing available, something that she became increasingly interested in, but only if she said it could be of use to others. So that's really important. She was very influenced by the work of her mentor, Selma James, the Marxist feminist who had founded the International Wages for Housework campaign and who had published a book called Sex, Race, and Class that she described as organizing tools for the movement. And similarly, and I wanted this book to be seen as a book that could be used by activists, by movements that could serve as organizing tools. In other words, she wanted this book to be of use to others. First of all, she wanted this book to be um, written in a way and produced in a way that it could be understood by the grassroots multiracial women, black, Indian, and indigenous from Guyana, 
who were part of Red Thread. So she wanted a book for them, for their children, for their children's children that would be part of a record of their story. But she also wanted the book to be of use for others. And so in that sense, she selected very carefully pieces on domestic violence, on racial violence, on state violence, on the importance of caring work, on the importance of social reproduction, on the importance of seeing housewives as a central part of a care economy, um, on, on the struggle to unite the Caribbean, on the struggle against imperialism, on the need for the Caribbean left to own up to its own mistakes, on the need to call out the feminist movement for its class, um, its silences on questions of class, on the need to criticize the political parties and the trade union movements for their silence on questions of gender. Um, so in that sense, it was, it, it, it's to be seen as a text that is meant to encourage others to reflect on their own histories, on their own experiences, and on their own struggles. And the book is divided into four sections. The book begins, first of all, with the criticism, which is always a self-criticism. For and I, uh, the pronoun is always the we and not the I. Um, the movement is always about um, seeking to understand one's history, but also learning from one's mistakes and approaching it with a sense of humility and with humor as well. So the first section of the book is about the critique. It's about the critique of the Caribbean left. It's about the critique of the Caribbean women's movement. It's about the critique of traditional political organizing that has led to racial divisions in Guyana. And these are all movements that she has been involved in. So the critique is also simultaneously an autocritique. So if we see the first part as the critique, in a sense it is clearing the space to say, here are some of the things that we did wrong. Here are some of the things that when we thought we were trying to change the world, these are the things that we missed. These are the things that I have learned. It clears the way in the second part of the book for her to outline the philosophy and praxis of caring work and of what it means to organize, beginning with grassroots women, beginning with those who have the least, beginning with on-wage work and understanding on-wage work as not only central to capitalism, but understanding housewives as a fairly significant, as is in fact a very significant sector of the working class whose experiences and whose interests need to be discussed and brought into the movement in important ways. So the second part of the book is really laying out the philosophy and praxis of care work and as of the way that care work becomes a point from which one organizes um, to transform the world through the concrete experiences of red thread that you read about in the second part of the book. The third part of the book is called the political in the personal. The usual way that we um, understand this phrase in feminist circles is the personal is political. But for Andaya, she often says there's a lot that is personal that is just foolishness. So instead of saying the personal is always political, she prefers to think about the political in the personal. And this is an entire section where she talks about sexual violence, she talks about um, domestic violence, and she talks about her own journey with cancer, um, which was also a journey that begins with her, but then moves out from her own bodily experience of living with an illness and living with a disability to try to understand cancer within the context of the global economy, within the context of unequal relations, within the context of access to health care in relation to class and racial and gendered inequalities. Um, and, and also about the care work that allowed her to survive, not only to survive, but to thrive and to work. So the care work and the relations of community that bring people together, that offer a different kind of value that is based not on commodification, not on profit, um, but is based on understanding our interdependence in a world that is built on a value that recognizes those caring relations with each other, with the land and with, um, with all, living, all living beings. And then the fourth and final section of the book is very short. It's really about trying to think about a regional movement within the context of the Caribbean, within the context of Latin America and the Caribbean, um, the other America, as, as we say. So trying to envision what it means to think about radical change and radical transformation in this contemporary 
period that we are living in. At the time that she died in 2019, Guyana had discovered one of the world's largest sources of oil offshore in our waters. Um, the multinational companies led by ExxonMobil and Hess were coming into the country. Um, it was a time of great um, concern for Andai, but it was also a time for her, therefore, that meant that what we had to do was organized. She had a phrase that she put into circulation in 2012 in Guyana in the midst of a, um, a community strike that took place in a mining community. And she described this strike using um, six words, how will we organize to live? And I think in a sense, that's really sort of the motto of this book, how will we organize to live? The answer has to be organizing. It has to be movement-based, it has to be collective, it has to bring us together across our differences, understanding and making space for our differences, differences of race, of sexuality, of gender and class, but making space for our differences within the context of building a, a broad movement for transformation, a movement that is anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. How do you clear the way for class struggle? And how do you build unity through struggle? Is the, those are the questions, I think, in search of answers that this book hopes to provide in some small way um, these kinds of tools. And if it can be of use to others, um, that I think would be um, the greatest legacy of this book for those of you who are coming to encounter it in Brazil. And we are so thankful to Editora Funilaria and the Laura Campos and uh, Marielle Franco Foundation for bringing it to a Brazilian audience. Thank you. Mm -hmm.